Shall we get started, Stephanie? Yes, I think we should. Okay, great. Hello, I'm Denise Dunbar, publisher and executive editor of the Alexandria Times news member, newspaper and a board member of the DC Pro Chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists. I'll be your moderator for today's discussion on freedom of information in Virginia. I'm joined today by a terrific panel of journalists that includes lawyers, a former SPJ national chairman, and investigative reporters. If democracy dies in darkness, as the Washington Post motto states, then it's the role of journalists and the purpose of journalism to shine lights into corners that many in power would prefer stay shrouded in shadow. It's also the role of journalists to present often complex information about topics that greatly impact the lives of ordinary residents, and in so doing, help them make informed decisions as they vote and engage in their communities. But journalists can only present information that they can access. The Federal Freedom of Information Act was passed by Congress and signed into law by then President Lyndon B. Johnson in 1966 and took effect the next year. The Virginia Freedom of Information Act was passed by the General Assembly in 1968. Both the federal and state law have been updated numerous times in the past 50 years. Topics that we will discuss during the next 90 minutes fall into three basic categories. The process of FOIA, best practices for effectively obtaining and using FOIA, and how FOIA relates to other types of government transparency. There you go. I'm going to introduce each panel member as I ask them their initial question. We'll start first with Paul Fletcher, who is publisher and editor-in-chief of Virginia's Lawyers Weekly. Paul is also former national president of the Society of Professional Journalists. He received his law degree from Washington and Lee University and also holds degrees from the College of William and Mary and Emory University. He has won numerous state and, and national journalism awards, including honors for editorial, column, and feature writing. He is an adjunct journalism instructor at the Robertson School of Media and Culture at Virginia Commonwealth University. So Paul, as a legal expert, can you please take us through the basic provisions of the Federal Freedom of Information Act and briefly explain key ways in which Virginia's freedom of information law differs? Sure, thanks Denise. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, I think this is a great program. I'm really pleased to see uh, SBJ VA and SBJ DC uh, coming together to, to put on a program such as this one. Um, and the, the question you raise is, um, is a good way to set the table for today. And so I'm going to be um, somewhat broad in my discussion of the two acts because they are quite different. Um, and the interesting thing that some of you may know, some of you may not, is that the Federal Freedom of Information Act was the work of SPJ. Uh, it actually was back when it was known as Sigma Delta Chi, uh, later became known as the Society of Professional Journalists. Leaders from Sigma Delta Chi were the ones who pushed and pushed and pushed to get a Freedom of Information um, Act a bill through Congress. Uh, and it's based on the um, basic notion that the government uh, should be open to the people and that the citizens of this nation should be able to know what their government is up to. Uh, the leaders of SDX tried in the early 60s, tried again. Uh, Lyndon Johnson um, hated the idea and he hated, hated it when it was ultimately passed in 1966. Uh, there were some questions about whether he was going to uh, sign it or not, uh, but he ultimately did, you know, where he liked to have these grand programs with flourishes and he'd sign, you know, use 86 different pins to sign a piece of legislation. It probably was done kind of on the side in the back room, uh, but he did sign it uh, and it did become law, uh, as you noted in 1967. The leaders of SDX said, okay, time to fan out. And so they went through um, many other um, 
uh, many state legislatures seeking to get state freedom of information laws passed. Uh, and in, in Virginia, it was relatively quickly. Uh, it was two years later, 1968, uh, when it was passed. Um, the bills or the, the, the laws as they exist um, have changed quite a bit over time. Um, most of the time it's uh, finding ways to not comply with the uh, FOI laws in, on either a federal or a state level. Um, the Federal Freedom of Information Act uh, provides you access to agency records. And that's um, really about it in terms of, you know, that's not uh, understating that, but that is where it is aimed. You have the ability as a journalist, but as a citizen, because it's important to note that uh, the freedom of information laws in both on both a federal and state level are usable by any citizen. You don't have to be a journalist writing a story to justify it. Uh, you as a, a Virginian, as an American, uh, are entitled to those records. Um, the federal FOIA has nine major exemptions uh, that have to do some with personnel, some with personal information, um, exemption five is the one that you'll read a whole lot about and is used pretty widely. That has to do with opinions, conclusions, and recommendations uh, in inter and intra agency memos. And so you'll find um, government actors trying to use that one uh, in particular. The three exclusions have to do with uh, national security or, or criminal law matters. Uh, but other than that, there's, there's laid out in the law a whole procedure uh, where you can make an FOI request. You can go online and find quite a few um, uh, forms, uh, any number of places that would be very helpful um, and to help you make the, um, the request. Now, the Virginia FOI passed again in 68. I want to read the preamble, you know, the way that they put out, they'll pass laws, they'll say, they usually say something like this bill, this measure will be known as the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. And then it provides a preamble that more or less gives you the rationale for the fact that the General Assembly, our represented representatives in Richmond are passing it. And this one says, by enacting this chapter, the General Assembly ensures the people of the Commonwealth ready access to public records in the custody of a public body or its officers and employees and free entry to meetings of public bodies wherein the business of the people is being conducted. So let's pause a minute. That gives you two things right off the bat. You have access to public records in the custody of a public body and its officers and employees. That's more than an agency. And then the second part is not to be found in the federal FOIA. You get free entry to meetings, free meaning they're not gonna charge you anything, um, to meetings of public bodies wherein the business of the people is being conducted. The affairs of government are not intended to be conducted in an atmosphere of secrecy, since at all times the public is to be the beneficiary of any action taken at any level of government. And unless a public body or its officers or employees specifically elect to exercise an exemption provided by this chapter or another statute. There's the rub. Uh, every meeting shall be open to the public and all public records shall be available for inspection and copying upon request. All public records and meetings shall be presumed open unless an exemption is properly invoked. And um, as the others on this panel will, on, will no, no, no doubt get into, there are uh, really quite a few exemptions that have been passed, many of which apply to specific factual patterns or specific groups. Um, but in a nutshell, Denise, there you have it. That's the, the difference between federal FOIA and state FOIA. They have a lot of the same uh, purpose, but they do operate a little bit differently. 
Thank you, Paul. And just one quick follow up to that. It isn't another difference that the federal um, government cannot charge media organizations, but the state of Virginia and localities can? Yes. Okay. Yeah. They, I'm sorry, they can charge. They just have the authority to waive. And who do you mean by they? In the federal, in the federal law. Okay, interesting. Okay, and we'll get back to that in a minute. Let's um, go on to the next uh, panelist. Um, Jeff South is president of the Society of Professional Journalists Virginia Pro Chapter. He worked more than 20 years as a reporter and editor at newspapers in Virginia, Texas, and Arizona, then taught journalism for more than 20 years at Virginia Commonwealth University. As a Fulbright scholar and newsroom trainer, he has worked with journalism students and practitioners in Asia, Eastern Europe, and Latin America, and across the United States. Welcome, Jeff. Well, um, thank you, Denise. Um, so a question I would like to pose to you as a follow-up to Paul is, can you explain what constitutes a FOIA request? Is there a specific form? And can you talk about the difference between a FOIA request and just a basic request for information from the Virginia state government or a local government? Okay, thank you. Um, I would be happy to talk about that. My guess is Megan and Paul may have more expertise in that area, but my understanding and the way um, I have taught journalists and journalism students about FOIA is that a FOIA request is any request for information. It can be over the phone. It does not have to be a formal written request. When you ask a government official for something, that constitutes a FOIA request and the law then requires them to respond. Having said that, um, when I um, was either leading a newsroom in Austin, Texas, for example, I was the state editor and um, overseeing a group of reporters covering the Capitol um, and state government. And every Monday at our staff meeting, we would file or we would decide what to FOIA that week. We kind of just built in, into our staff meetings. You know, let's kind of have a FOIA of the week. And, and those were always formal letters. Nowadays, of course, um, FOIAs can be filed um, electronically. So an email constitutes a FOIA request. Um, there are FOIA letter generators. Um, Megan's organization, the Virginia Coalition for State for um, Open Government, has a really good one for state level um, FOIA requests. Uh, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press um, is a national organization, as is another uh, project called Muckrock um, that both have um, national level FOIA letter generators, make it very, very easy to simply plug in what information you want, who has it, and it then generates um, a, uh, a letter that cites the law and um, gives you a kind of a, I don't know, some gravitas in terms of knowledge of the law and knowledge of what's expected of that government official receiving the, the request. Okay. Um, the, uh, I, I've been using um, a service called ifoia.org. It's um, created by the committees, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. What I like about that is that it not only generates the letter and helps you find who to email it to, but it also databases your request. And so when you when you file that, you create a free account. You file the your your FOIA request. It then keeps track of how many days that agency has to answer your request. And if they haven't <laughs> answered, it then sends you a reminder that hey, you know, um, uh, they've they've, uh, they're not complying with the law. Should we send a, a follow-up request? And so there are a number of really good resources nowadays for helping um, both prepare your FOIA request and, um, and get it into the right hands and then monitor what happens. 
That's great. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll kind of stop there. That sounds great. Um, Denise, there, there's one thing that um, I would mention to follow up uh, a follow up comment to what uh, Jeff had to say. Okay. In 2016, um, Congress passed um, uh, basically uh, the Fix FOIA bill. The, there was a, a large movement of which SPJ was um, one member. There was a coalition called the Sunshine and Government um, Group. It was SPJ, RTDNA, the, the broadcasters group, uh, the AP, a number of major journalism groups and entities all worked together to fix FOIA by 50. And that was to get uh, a number of um, updates to bring FOIA into the 21st century, essentially. And one of the things that was supposed to happen was to create a common portal. Uh, because now you have so many different federal agencies, they have so many different ways of requiring a requester to make the, the FOI request. This was going to make a single portal that would make it easy um, for citizens um, and journalists um, to make a, a records request. Uh, that did pass. Obama was about as thrilled to sign it as LBJ had been to sign the original bill. <laughs> he did. Um, and um, then, of course, the following fall, Mr. Trump got elected and I haven't heard a whole lot about fixing FOIA since then. Okay. Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens with that moving forward then. Yes, agreed. So moving, um, moving ahead, um, our next panelist is Megan Ryan, who is executive director of the Virginia Coalition for Open Government. Megan received her undergraduate degree from the University of North Carolina and holds a law degree from the University of Colorado Law School. She teaches classes on FOIA and the legislative process at Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the College of William and Mary. Megan has been executive director of the Virginia Coalition for Op Open Government for the past 12 years. Welcome, Megan. Um, I was wondering if you could explain a bit about the Virginia Coalition for Open Government's mission and how reporters and individuals pursuing public records can use your organization as a resource. Well, thank you, Denise. Thank you so much for including me on this panel um, and with uh, people that I uh, know and respect and like. And the Virginia Coalition for Open Government is fortunate to have um, on its board of directors uh, two of these panelists here, Paul and Jeff, are both on, um, on our board. I'm the sole employee, but I wouldn't be able to do it if I didn't have a very helpful um, and influential um, board members to direct me. Um, the, the coalition started in 1996. It was funded primarily by the Press Association, Virginia Press Association and the Virginia Association of Broadcasters, as well as individual media outlets. Um, and the notion was that at the time there was a, um, a perception and it's, it lingers, it's not pro probably not as strong now as it used to be, but there was a perception that um, the Freedom of Information Act was a media law and that why should legislators uh, try to improve it when all it was going to be used for was by nosy journalists to um, you know, play gotcha with politicians. And so the coalition was started to uh, be the voice of the public uh, to, the, uh, to the legislatures as well as to the public. So as to let them know that the Freedom of Information Act is a law for everyone. So um, we, uh, day in and day out, we, uh, well, we're a member supported organization. Um, hint, hint. Um, and, um, we, uh, provide services for anyone who calls. Even if you're not a member, even if you haven't donated, we are always available to uh, take calls and questions. Um, I've jotted down some figures. Um, I've had, you know, just since the beginning of November, I've had seven calls, which isn't a whole lot, but considering there was elect an election in the middle of it, it's actually kind of a, kind of a lot. But they've spanned six different localities. They've 
covered local government, schools, courts, police, a meetings question, and six records questions. So that's just in a week, uh, a little over a week. Um, year, to date, we've received 408 calls, emails, tweets, Slack messages, and Facebook questions. Roughly half of those are from reporters, and um, almost half of those have to do with records requests. Um, as I said, they, those services are available to anyone, and um, it's and and by anyone, I, that also includes government because um, I think um, the coalition has made it pretty clear that training um, government employees is as important as training journalists. We all need to be on the same page, and so when I get calls from reporters, um, oftentimes they're ready to, you know, ready for a fight or, you know, they can't do that kind of thing. And it's, um, it, it's incumbent on me to say, no, this is actually, you know, what they've done here is actually the right way and it stinks. And I know I'm, so, <laughs> but I don't want to um, get in a position where I'm trying to, um, fig, you know, find some way to bend the interpretation or, um, facilitate some sort of um, adversarial process. It's really um, in everyone's benefit for us to approach uh, the FOIA process in a non-adversarial kind of way and with a strong foundation of, um, of knowledge, um, of understanding of how the law operates. So in addition to those kinds of questions and stuff, we do provide training um, for, general, uh, for government employees or for anyone else who asks. We put on an annual conference. We do um, some, you know, a couple webinars and other um, events throughout the year. We do Sunshine Week events, uh, do newsletters, very active on social media. We also have internships. Um, one in the um, General Assembly, because another part of our job is to lobby the General Assembly for uh, better, better access laws. Uh, we have that internship uh, for a college student um, during the legislative session, and we have an internship for a rising second year law student during the summer to do research for us. Great, thank you. In your, uh, your comments about striving for a non-adversarial relationship actually is a good segue to our next panelist, Jim McElhatton. Um, Jim is a freelance investigative reporter who previously worked for the Washington Times as a staff investigative reporter. In addition to the Washington Times, his work has appeared in US News and World Report, the Washington City Paper, and the Alexandria Times and other publications. Jim won two Virginia Press Association awards for his investigative series on the integration of Alexandria City Schools that ran in the Alexandria Times over the past several years. Jim, as an investigative reporter, can you please share your thoughts on the most effective way to approach FOIA? And also, how can the concept of basic civility be your friend in the process? Um, sure, uh, first of all, thank you for having me because um, uh, Denise, uh, I, I happen to live in Alexandria, and Denise is kind of, I, I've, I've been on the outside looking in for a couple of years now. Um, I used to be a reporter for many years. Uh, Jeff, I used to work at the Beaumont Enterprise. I probably sent you my resume at some point, but um, I'm, uh, and I, I've been up in the D.C. area, and, and so I worked as a reporter for many, many years, and, and now I work as a, as a private investigator, and, and mostly my work uh, involves uh, working for attorneys who represent uh, whistleblowers and, and federal employees who are subject to some sort of discrimination and, and that sort of thing. And, um, but, I, but I still do stories now and again, and, um, and I miss it a great, great deal. Um, and um, before, I, before I answer Denise's question, the thought came into my head, which was that, um, being on the outside looking in, I can tell you that, that the most powerful thing that the press has is the ability to contact a federal agent or a federal local uh, state agency and email them, call them up and say, uh, hey, you know, PIO or whoever you are, I found out about X and you have 48 hours to tell me an answer to my question. Um, I miss that. 
and and because because I can have access to different databases and and all kinds of stuff, but 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 that um, but with that comes great responsibility, and 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 maybe someday I'll I'll, I'll get back to journalism. But but anyway, um, in answer to Denise's question, what um, today when I went on my phone, I saw a story about uh, the newborn panda bear at the Washington Zoo, and um, Many years ago, I think it was the panda Taishan or one of the pandas that was about to be shipped back to China. Um, I ended up doing a FOIA to the Washington Zoo for all correspondence to and from the Smithsonian to the State Department about the, uh, mentioning the word panda. And, and it was a good story. And it talked about all of these sort of back channel attempts to get Obama to mention the panda so we could keep the panda. Um, the, the point of that is, is that um, once I sent that FOIA in, the FOIA officer who was assigned that case called me back immediately excited and happy uh, because he had been bombarded with boring FOIAs having to do with treaties and, and all kinds of stuff. And he was legitimately excited to be working on this, on this FOIA and, and he wanted to help me. And, um, and it turned out to be a good story but, but the point of that is, is that FOIA officers are, are not, in, in many cases, different from reporters. They're, they're overworked, they're underpaid, they work at offices that, that don't get enough money, and, they, and, and if they do a good job for us, then their bosses are mad at them and vice versa. So um, I, I found a good strategy was always following up my requests with a phone call, uh, asking, you know, not, not forgoing any information I want, but, but asking if there's anything I can do in terms of tailoring my request to make their job easier. Um, and, and I wasn't, uh, you know, I, I think it is oftentimes too much of an adversarial relationship. And, and, and just even just, just calling up the FOIA officer to introduce yourself and staying in touch and, and, and keeping contact over the phone over a couple of weeks. Um, it can do wonders. I mean, I had FOIA officers that I knew that became, you know, sources for me. They would tell me about incoming FOIAs from competing media organizations by virtue of that. Um, and just by treating them like people uh, because they are. And uh, so that that's sort of, um, that doesn't mean you don't go to court. That doesn't mean you don't, uh, you know, go legal if you have to, but, but, by, but by treating folks with, with some you know, uh, humanity and compassion and empathy, it, it, it goes a long way. So anyway, thank you for having me. Yep. Sure, thank you. And um, that is also a segue into um, Evan Watson, um, our fifth panelist. Um, it's tough when your name begins with W. I'm sure you've gone last your whole life, Evan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but Evan is an investigative reporter for WVEC-TV in Norfolk. He joined the 13 News Now team as a reporter in July 2018, and he tells stories throughout Hampton Roads. Evan grew up in Overland Park, Kansas, and graduated with a journalism degree from the Bob Schieffer College of Communication at Texas Christian University. He started his broadcast journalism career as a multimedia journalist at WGXA in Macon, Georgia. And Evan, you've had considerable success these past couple of years obtaining information via FOIA for your stories for 13 News Now. What are your tips for success with FOIA? Yeah, thanks, Denise. And thank you all for, for having me to talk today. This is really wonderful. Um, two things first before I do that, I'll echo Jim. I think that the saying is you catch more flies with honey than vinegar, right? Uh, and just by being, by being kind or having that open relationship, I've had good luck with that as well. Um, and sometimes pre-COVID, I guess, walking into the office and saying, hey, you know, that name that you see emailed to you all the time, that's actually me. This is my face. This is what I look like. And then they're like, oh, okay, I, I definitely uh, will respond to you next time I get it or be more uh, aggressive that way, which is great. And I can also echo what Megan said earlier. I've, I've uh, uh, called or emailed her a couple of times over the past few years, and she's been very helpful, uh, give me some tips as well. So if anyone out there doing on the ground reporting, uh, like myself, definitely use that resource and contribute uh, what you can. So uh, to your question, Denise, on success in the past few years, I wanted to kind of talk about it on the on the ground level or on the daily, you know, 
the, the best way to get better at, at FOIAs is to file FOIAs, in my opinion, just keep doing it and, and continue. And um, I, I've had uh, something where about every Friday, I make sure I, I send some kind of FOIA out to keep an Excel spreadsheet where you're um, aware of the deadlines, because if you're not checking up sometimes, oftentimes those deadlines can be blown. So just insert that information about what, what documents you're going to get and uh, uh, be persistent with it. And I've also used FOIA and just open records as essentially an extension of my curiosity in a lot of cases. And it doesn't have to, uh, I guess what I want to say is that the, the, the reporters I work with at my station and, and some other uh, stations or other places in this market, a lot of them are uh, seemingly intimidated by FOIA or open records requests. So they come to me and say, hey, can you help me phrase this or word this, uh, which I'm always happy to do um, but I always view it as something that, you know, you have to, you have to look at excitedly, not intimidatingly. It shouldn't be something you begrudge doing. And even if it's something small, you can find interesting pieces of information with that. Um, and if it's an extension of your curiosity, you can find a lot about it. There was a story last year that, uh, I was, I came in in the morning and saw the morning show had a story on a house fire in Portsmouth. And uh, the, the fire chief was on our interview and he said, you know, we were late to put it out because the fire hydrant right next to the house was broken. So we had to go down to the one down the street. Um, and I thought, well, that seems curious to me uh, that a fire hydrant is just out of service like that. Journalist mind, uh, how many fire hydrants are out of service and where are they? Uh, because if I was living in the neighborhood or living in that home down the street, I'd like to know that information. And so just me, I sent, FOIA requests that next day to all of the main cities in Hampton Roads in our area, Portsmouth, Norfolk, Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, Suffolk, Super News, Hampton, and asked for their out of service fire hydrants and reports of service requests and a couple of different things in there and found that Portsmouth had twice as many broken fire hydrants as all the other cities combined. And this was kind of a systemic problem with them. And just from a curiosity point, throwing kind of a dart at a map there, you're able to find a good local journalism piece, and then you can find your sources from there about people who've had some house fires in the past years. And so it wasn't any groundbreaking investigation. Um, it, it, it did do really well and made a good impact and they uh, changed their policies from the city government level. Um, but I also tell people that, you know, you can FOIA what seems to be small stuff to you at the time, like like Jim with the, with the new animal at the zoo or whatever that is, and then continue finding good information and it builds up from there and your stories will, will grow that way. So um, on the ground level, that's what I definitely encourage, encourage everyone to do. So basically it sounds like a bit like what you're both saying is you build FOIA sources just like you build any other type of source as a journalist. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, all right. So we've talked about sort of the collegial way um, a, a approach to FOIA. So what happens if you you've tried your honey and you you know you you get in your routine you've cultivated the FOIA officers but you're still not getting anywhere um Paul what if a reporter uh, or a resident's attempts are unsuccessful with FOIA or the reporter thinks that information has been improperly withheld can you talk about the mandamus petition to circuit court and how and when reporters should use this tool oh I think you're muted are you muted, Paul? I am. Sorry. You got to start again. <laughs> what's, what's the uh, Zoom line of the year? Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> anyway, I would echo uh, both Jim and Evan that, uh, you know, endorsing the, um, the collegial approach to getting information because um, it is so easy to make a request under the Virginia uh, FOIA statute um and i know the you know the main agency that that my newsroom deals with is the virginia state bar uh and they're very good uh at um providing information and a lot of it is uh when necessary we've run into this as well um is education you know letting people know that um you know i am entitled to this this is how the law works uh, please let's let's work together on this. Um, and I, you know, if you don't get the information, I would counsel trying that again. 
before going to litigation, which is, you know, ramping it up real quick and in a hurry, <clears throat> the, um, you do have two, um, two options under the Virginia statute. You can either seek an injunction or you can get a writ of mandamus, which sounds very, um, very serious and very legalistic. Uh, but it's simply this, you know, I think a lot of people know what an injunction is. That's where you go to court and you say, judge, I want you to get, I want you to stop this. I want you to make them stop. Uh, and if the, the court so decides, they will enjoin. They'll issue an injunction and they have to stop. Uh, a writ of mandamus is the opposite. It is, judge, I want you to get them to do something. Um, and um, if you get it granted, the court is saying, yes, you must do, must do something. Uh, the Virginia statute provides uh, for a, a procedure where you can go to court uh, and seek uh, mandamus uh, against an agency, uh, against a government, against anybody who is subject to the Virginia um, Freedom of Information Act. Um, the uh, the upside and the downside is, the upside is you've got this procedure. And uh, one of the things I found uh, as I was preparing for today is that uh, like for general requests at both the state and federal level, you can find forms. Uh, the Student Press Law Center has a particularly good form pleading to go to um, general district uh, to go to circuit court. There are two two levels of court uh, that you might go to in Virginia. General district court uh, is the lower level court. It's kind of the people's court, uh, smaller conflicts uh, uh, are brought there. Circuit court is uh, a court of record. That's where you're gonna have jury trials and that kind of thing. Uh, and you can find forms. There was a, a fill in the blank form that you can use in general district court because a lot of the, the pleadings, and by that I mean the papers that you end up filing, um, you just check some boxes or you fill out blanks and that's your, your document. Um, in circuit court, it's a little more formal um, and a little more complicated, frankly, because you've got to make sure you plead all the right things. Uh, this student press law center piece covered a lot of the bases and I thought it was quite good. Uh, it's written for students, but I think anybody could use it. Um, the advantages of, of filing a mandamus, uh, it gives the, uh, the governmental entity the idea that you're serious. And you might be able to file it and then use that as kind of a negotiating tactic to say, okay, look, I don't really want to go forward with this. Can we talk? You know, this is what I'm seeking. This is what I, why I think I'm entitled to it you'll get their attention because if they have to spend money, I mean, the whole thing about going to court is gonna cost money. Uh, it's either they're gonna cost the government money and they've got, uh, you know, I ran across one pleading that was against the city of Norfolk. The city of Norfolk's got a city attorney's office that's full of, of lawyers, uh, probably one of whom is their uh, expert on dealing with these kind of things. Um, so you might end up talking to him or her uh, and trying to negotiating your way to it. Or the problem for you is the person seeking the, um, the records, it costs money, just like it costs the defendant money. Uh, so it depends on what kind of news organization uh, you might work at. Uh, if you're a journalist, if you've got um, one of the larger ones that might have one of the, the big law firms on retainer, they might be interested in, you know, writing the, the necessary letters to um, move things along. Uh, if you're a smaller operation or a freelance person, um, you're going to have to rely on your own ability to try to sweet talk them because it's going to cost you cash. And uh, that's often why people don't pursue uh, these kinds of um request. But those, those are your options in terms of what you might be able to do. 
Okay, and as a follow-up to that, Megan, um, I know there's also a, a mandamus form on your organization's um, website. Uh, as, as the other lawyer on the panel, would you like to add anything to Paul's comment there? Um, well, I, I, yes, one of the things that I'd like to add is the power, well, is to emphasize the power of actually filing something. Um, in general district court, and I know, so citizens are much more likely to use the general district courts. And they have used it many, many times successfully. They've used it unsuccessfully, sometimes because they had bad facts, but not because of anything a judge did. But the point, uh, but, but for some reason, um, media folks have been reluctant to use general district courts. I think they do, especially the bigger organizations, the bigger the news organization, the more they think that if we're gonna go into this, we have to do it big. We have to go the circuit court route with an attorney and we have to be prepared to take this all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, the Virginia Supreme Court and hundreds of thousands of dollars. But it, it, there is symbolic action in filing a report, say a reporter filing a claim in general district court that said, this is what happened because that, um, that becomes news, that becomes the story. Um, it can serve as leverage, because um, sometimes people, as Paul said, people don't necessarily think the reporter's serious. Um, and because general district court is non-binding, I mean, if that turns into something more, it could go to circuit court. And I guess that does have to be um, taken into the calculus as well, but it's not an automatic appeal. They would have to start the case. If you won and the government lost, the government would have to initiate the case, which I don't think they can under FOIA. Um, so I guess, you know, I, I, it's easy for me to say, hey, you guys should sue, you guys should file uh, for in general district court. But I wouldn't underestimate the power the power of that as um, an arrow in your your quiver essentially that you know okay. you've got that power so maybe you should use it and uh, as a follow-up <laughs> question i've got um i'm going to direct the next one uh, back to you megan and then we have actually a few people from the audience who are asking related kind of questions so um i think we should stay on this general topic of um, uh, non-compliance because I think a lot of people who are tuned in here today are frustrated um, if for various reasons with their attempts to FOIA. So um, one key way, Megan, in which Virginia state government as well as local jurisdictions withhold information is by claiming exemptions that, that Paul mentioned earlier. How can reporters and individuals push back if they think exemptions are being improperly used to suppress information? Uh, so yes, court. <laughs> um, but a couple of things to remember. Um, for one, uh, um, attempts to suppress is different from the proper exercise of an exemption. If the law allows for an exemption or prohibits disclosure, I think this kind of gets to Jim's point of these are, these are just people these are people applying the law and how far, you know, and the question then would be, have they applied this, um, have they applied this exemption in a way that comports with the policy statement that Paul quoted at the beginning that says that exemptions are to be narrowly construed um, in favor of access. So you're going to be asking, that's the question you're going to be asking is, is this a proper invocation of this particular um, exemption. And the reason why I'm making this distinction is because the notion that they are suppressing information does automatically put a gloss on it that, you, that says that they are acting in bad faith. And they may not be acting in bad faith, they're just applying this, this exemption in the way that they interpret the law. So, Maybe that's splitting hairs, but I do think it's it's part of the adverse, you know, trying to ratchet it down to a non-adversarial kind of process. But should you be con 
confronted with uh, the use of an exemption that you think is improperly uh, being applied. Um, FOIA has throughout, the, throughout it many provisions that encourage requesters and government to work together to arrive at a mutually beneficial um, um, solution. So sometimes that might include you um, talking with them to kind of figure out, well, if I can't get this, can, you know, what can I get? Um, how can I get answers? These are the questions that I have. And how do I get the information that I need to answer these questions? Um, the exemptions do exist. It's um, uh, also, as, as Paul mentioned at the beginning as well, it's, there are a lot of them, but a lot of them are agency specific. And so the number can be uh, misleading because it looks like a whole lot, but really there are only, there's a fairly narrow number of exemptions that any agency could use. Um, you know, like Florida gets, gets put up as being, you know, one of the best, um, if not the best um, states for, for access, but they have a thousand plus exemptions. They're very, very narrow, but they have, you know, <laughs> there, there are a lot of them, but they're, um, so, you know, rather than get hung up on the, the number of exemptions, um, let's see how they're being applied. Um, and I find, so, you, in addition to court, um, and it, I mean, in addition to talking on one end, in addition to court on the other, is um, using your other resources as a reporter. And I have to say, I'm not a reporter, so I don't, I never have been. So I can't really advise on how you exactly do that. But I do know um, that men, that oftentimes the records you have that you look are looking for are held by multiple parties and not all of those parties are going to interpret the law in the same way. And some of them can't interpret it in the same way. And I'm gonna give two examples here. One was when Tim Kaine was governor and he was also um, his last year head of the Democrat National Committee. And Republicans wanted to know that when he traveled out of state, was he traveling for Virginia business or was he traveling for DNC business? And so they FOIA'd his, his uh, travel schedule and he, he used the working papers exemption, which um, you know, there was some, you know, there was some uh, precedent for using it in that way. Uh, but so then the AP got a hold of it and the AP said, well, you know what, when he travels, he has to have some security detail. So they went to the Virginia State Police and asked for records related to the security that they had provided Kane during you know the months certain months and they were able through you know just some you know cross-referencing and using other sources they were able to figure out where he was going when he was going out of out of state and making drawing some conclusions the second example comes from um, newport news former newport news delegate phil hamilton uh, republican so i want to make sure i'm you know <laughs> i got a democrat who did it and a republican who did it um, he was being, uh, Democrats got wind that he was helping Old Dominion University secure money uh, for the creation of a teaching center at ODU. And he was on the Appropriations Committee at the General Assembly. And he was also lobbying to become the director of the center once it was created. And so they asked for his email and he again, properly invoked the working papers exemption. But then again, the AP said, well, you know, the people in, at Old Dominion, they don't have the working papers exemption. So they asked ODU for those emails and they had to turn them over. Hmm. So there are, you know, with uh, all apologies to the cat you've got, you've seen walking around here, there are multiple ways to skin the cat um, <laughs> when you are trying to get hold of records is that sometimes you just have to think of who else might have them and how you might um, get them from those people. All right, I, and I think your response, Megan, is, um, is actually a good segue to one of our uh, questions from the audience. So that's a little bit easier to do when you're at the federal level or the state level, when you have multiple entities, 
but when you're dealing with a local city government and basically everything goes in through the the one PIO or the one um, uh, FOIA office, or, or there are perhaps two, sometimes there's one is in our city in Alexandria, there's one for the overall city government and then the school system has their own FOIA um, officer. So this question comes from an Alexandria resident um, who says, what legal recourse do citizens have when a locality increasingly redacts a large amount of information claiming attorney client privilege when it would not appear that any attorney advice would be a part of the information in the request? When so much is redacted, how can a citizen know whether this is legitimate or an abuse of the ability to redact? Um, and I, I think it might be interesting if the two reporters kind of on the ground, um, Evan and, and Jim, respond to this first, and then maybe we get more of a legal response. Evan or Jim? <laughs> I'm happy to jump in. Um, I don't know what, what records uh, folks are seeking, but, but one thing I used to do um, would be to ask for the same, you know, when I, when I was dealing with a federal agency, sometimes I would ask for the same set of records from other federal agencies and, and sort of, you know, use other agencies compliance against the federal agency that was withholding the records. Um, we're, 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 we're in a presidential transition right now. There's um, every single federal agency uh, provides uh, binders and binders full of records, transition briefing books to uh, what will be the Biden transition team. Um, and after Obama came into office, I filed 150 requests for those same set of records from every single agency. And some agencies literally provided me boxes and boxes of records. Others said, there's no way you'll ever see these records and others just never bothered to respond. And that, that was always a good FOIA audit story. And you can talk about, you know, lack of widespread compliance and um, those records would come in handy years later for reasons I, I couldn't have known at the time. But, but if you're seeking records from a local government agency or um, a city government, asking for those same set of records from five or 10 other government, uh, you know, nearby governments. And then if nine out of the 10 produce the records, uh, at the very least, you can sort of apply pressure saying, um, you know, ours is the only city government that, that, that is refusing to provide these records. Why is that? And just hammer and hammer away. Um, you know, the, the, there, there's, the, the press has other powers beyond going to court. I, I always ended up in media organizations that were very loath to, um, you know, sue and go to court and, and back you for things like, uh, you know, I, um, I remember doing stories about uh, corruption in the DC government road paving industry. And, and I asked for records about the, literally the, 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 per, the square, footage unit price of asphalt in DC compared to other surrounding jurisdictions. And uh, I, I believe Alexandria refused that uh, many years ago, but um, you know, lawyers have to pick their battles and, and I, I, I did everything I could do to sort of avoid that. And, uh, but, but there's other ways of, of, of sort of, um, draw you know drawing public attention to the lack of compliance is one thing but if you can do it in a way that shows that other governments are more than willing to give these records to you but your government won't um I, th that that can sometimes do something so okay evan did you want to add anything to that um, it, we could we could segue if not it, into um you know sort of how you used um foia with uh, sort of along those lines with uh, adjacent governments. Yeah, yeah, I can I can talk about that. The exact thing that we're talking about on the point, I think Jeff mentioned in the chat or someone did but what Jim's saying there is before litigation is obviously to call attention to the lack of records, lack of transparency of actions and, and to use that to your advantage as leverage, which is definitely the same thing. Uh, 
for me, I've had some success recently um, with using FOIA as kind of a comparative analysis tool of getting similar records from different cities and then creating my own database or my own analysis of that to show a larger story or larger picture. Um, I think, Denise, what you're referring to, because we talked a couple, yesterday, a couple of days ago, is the uh, a story I, I just ran a week or two ago. This summer, we had a lot of talks on criminal justice reform, of course, the Virginia special session, the, the role of police, the question of funding of police, what that looks like. So I was thinking about how I could frame that in a way that'd be useful for our localities. And so what I requested was the uh, 911 calls for service by category for all of our local police departments and dispatchers. Um, and then was able to take that information, compare it between those seven cities I mentioned earlier and break it down into subcategories showing this is how much of the 911 calls are for violent crime, this is for property crime, this is for uh, fire alarms or threats, this is for medical or person in need, the increasing number of crisis intervention training things that we're talking about and hearing about. Um, these are property crime, something like that, because uh, uh, on the surface, I think a lot of members of the public and a lot of us uh, believe that uh, or, or may think that violent crime is a very large statistic because you hear about that a lot. But in Hampton Roads, it was about 3% of all calls for service were related to violent crime and the rest in all these other categories. So the natural questions that led to was, okay, so police officers are being used in these 10 areas. Here's the breakdown of that. Is that what we are looking for and intended? And uh, what, what do we do with that information? Kind of presenting it in that way. So for me, I had a couple cities that were better at giving records than others. Um, and, but then when I was able to show them, like Jen said, that, hey, I got this from Virginia Beach. I got this from Chesapeake. Um, here's a kind of an example. Because uh, also the other thing you run into with FOIA requests and open record requests is they uh, may say, uh, oh, we don't have a database ready for that. Or, um, or, or we don't have, and which like, uh, Megan's laughing, I, I can see, but you know, you have to work with them and say, okay, let me, let me work with you and see a way that you can present this. And so I was able to show them an example and say like, here's something I got from Chesapeake. I'm looking for this from you. I know you have this information. How can you get it? Also request it for me in an Excel format, not a PDF, which is another small tip, because then you can actually do analysis instead of just looking at the sheet. But um, it, it helped to have that kind of comparison right there, and it led to a much better story, and I was able to use that leverage. So uh, with Carter's question about citizens and, and legal recourse with um, a city government, maybe try that route, try to try to publicize the difficulties you're having and the inability to, to, to give out that information and then uh, see what happens from there. Thank you. Um, and a bit of a follow up to um, what you just said, Evan, and also to Carter's question um, is from Christopher Waymont, um, who's also from Alexandria, that he's a part of a group of over 2000 Alexandrias and, and they're trying to get more transparency in the city um, from the city government on a number of topics. And they FOIA the city multiple times on various subjects and they continue to receive redaction after redaction. Um, when it's really not clear that um, the redactions are are warranted, um, you know. So I mean, I guess just uh, I'm going to sort of push that uh, question back again. So we've talked about um, you know just some of the strategies, right? That um, Jim, you talked about uh, in your uh, chat response of actually FOIAing the the email trail, internal email trail, um, as a way of finding out what they've said about your request. Do you want to talk more about that, maybe? Um, I, I guess, uh, first of all, my initial reaction is if, if there's a group of 2,000 residents who are denied a FOIA request, if each one of them gave $5, uh, they'd be able to sort of bypass all this and hire an attorney and, and you know, go to court because because if the city is is sort of engaging in you know practice you know some sometimes unfortunately um, you know I sometimes unfortunately I, I think agencies and, and, and governments uh, do engage in, in bad practices and, and and do redact when they know they shouldn't and unfortunately legal recourse is, is the only way to go about it. Um, and if, if it's happening to this extent, and if you have a group of 2,000 residents 
and each one of them gave five bucks, you could go out and hire a good attorney. <laughs> um, that's that's honestly, you know, it, it shouldn't come to that. But but um, one thing I would always do when I was denied a FOIA or or there would be redactions I didn't that didn't make sense is. I'd file a subsequent FOIA for the administrative tracking file for my original FOIA. So, you know, my original FOIA would have a number attached to it, FOIA number, you know, dash dash three nine four. And, and then I would ask for the administrative tracking file for that FOIA, all emails and papers associated with it. And, and you know, sometimes that would actually be even more newsworthy than the original thing I was seeking. But but in the case you're describing, it, it sounds like, um, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know what they're asking for. So, so it's really hard to, it, it's hard to, hard to know. I always gave FOIA officers the benefit of the doubt and assumed that they were not unlike me, overworked and underpaid. And, but, but there were cases where that wasn't the case. And, and, you know, I would reach out to my local press organizations they would help me draft uh, FOIA appeals. I, I, you know, there are there are many organizations out there who are, who are more than willing to handle. Even if you're not a member, who will be willing to help you draft a, a really good appeal. And and I would go that route. And then if it was still denied, um, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, it's it's hard to say what I would do if I was. This sound. This is a different sort of you know, situation, but um, it's hard to know without knowing what they're asking for. Anyway, I'm running away. So. Yeah, just as a sort of follow up to that for um, for Megan and Paul from the sort of legal perspective, um, it seems like a lot of times local governments claim either attorney, client or personnel, um, you know, and so, you know, what if you're you're trying to find out information that in emails back and forth somebody was, um, you know, perhaps there was some sort of a, um, a threat to somebody's position. Um, you suspect that in emails that have gone back and forth. Um, and they claim these exemptions that really don't necessarily seem to apply. Um, you know, uh, there there's, was no attorney present. And um, uh, anyway, uh, what do you do when you, I mean, I guess we're sort of asking the same question over and over again to a certain extent, but is there any other recourse or, um, you know, any other thoughts on that? Um, hey, for Paula. <laughs> if not, well, we'll I, I'm not sure how Paul might want to um, respond, but I do need to make uh, clear that um, the communications director at the city of Alexandria is on the VCOG board of directors. So um, I wouldn't say anything differently, but I do think it's important that uh, your, your questioners know that that's, that that's how it goes. Um, it, two points though, to, in addition is to also say that, um, remember that, you know, Redactions are the same as exemptions. And so it, they can apply and they may apply. And as Jim said, it, so it really is gonna depend whether or not it's legitimately being used, depends on what's being asked for. Um, and then um, secondly is, yeah, just like anything else, your enforcement mechanism is in court. Okay. All right, and a follow-up to that was, uh, uh, Josh from the audience asked, at what point are penalties pursued for FOIA violations? Um, so, you know, not just an injunction, but are there actual, you know, true penalties that can be imposed on violations? Uh, yes. There, um, so FOIA does provide for a civil penalty of between 500 and 2,500 for a first violation subsequent ones, um, I think that's doubled, um, for willful and knowing conduct. Um, that sounds good, uh, but it does unfortunately have to be acknowledged that judges are very reluctant to impose civil penalties. I think they identify with their fellow public servants and don't want to think that they acted uh, intentionally. 
in the case of this, that's why the, you know, the civil penalty imposed against the speaker um, last month was, you know, exceptional, not just because of who it was against, but because it was actually imposed at all. Um, but yeah, that can be part of it. And then fines have to be paid out of the public officials uh, pocket and they go to the state literary fund. Huh. Okay. That's nice. <laughs> How often do you think that happens? Well, as I just said that, you know, it doesn't happen very often. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Um, a bit of a more practical um, question for um, Evan and Jim is you filed your FOIA request um, and what you get is a thousand email dump with um, multiple uh, email uh, chains sort of saying the same thing over and over again. Um, how do you wade through all that or, or not be sort of so discouraged by the volume of what you've gotten? You want to take a shot at that, Evan? Uh, I, I don't know if I have a great tip for that. I, I wade through it with patience and, and a little bit of excitement because if I'm getting that many records that are not redacted, that means that I have more <laughs> opportunities to find something. So, okay. um, um, but yeah, your, your normal search tools and everything like that. The, the one frustrating thing is when you get those email FOIAs and they have uh, the, the stack of a response and then when someone replies, they copy that stack of response to scroll through. But um, uh, yeah, it's just with uh, with the opportunity and with, uh, with a little bit of patience for me. I don't know if Jim has a better answer than that. Jim, do you have anything? Uh, to I don't. M okay. most, uh, I, I will say that I have Adobe Pro and that many years ago, I would sometimes be able to sort of copy over the uh, big chunks of redacted material and then go into a text document and actually paste and, and the words would show up, but that doesn't happen too often these days. But <laughs> the first thing I would do is say, you know, thank you. If, if they supplied that, that, that those, you know, thousands of pages of records, I'd, I'd thank them and, you know, get to work, so. Sounds good. Well, and related to that is, um, is a question about cost. Um, uh, uh, Jeff or um, really uh, any of the panelists who want to respond to this is, do you have tips for keeping FOIA costs down while still getting the information that you need? You know, whether it's a newspaper, um, TV station, or, you know, private individual or a citizens group, none of these entities are particularly flush with cash in general, or, you know, have money that they want to just spend, um, you know, on, on FOIAs, particularly, you know, what's discouraging is you spend $300 on a FOIA and then you look through the you know material and there's really nothing there. Um, how, how do you recommend trying to keep the cost down? Well, I can, I can kind of start the discussion there. And I, the first step, of course, is to include in your FOIA, your written FOIA request, a line that says, if the estimate for providing these records exceeds a certain dollar amount, $50, $100, whatever you want to use as what you're comfortable with, you know, let me know in advance. And that way, at least you know what you what your what your costs are going to be. And if those seem excessive, and sometimes government agencies do use the cost, um, the cost of records to kind of scare you off, but if it does, if it seems excessive, then to come back and and tailor your request and say, ah, okay, so, you know, suppose I ask for a shorter time frame or a more targeted um, kind of request, you might be able to get that number down. So, I, I mean, I, I would start there by certainly insisting on. Um, being notified if the estimate for records are go is going to exceed some dollar amount. Okay. Evan, how does it work at, at your station? Do you have a FOIA budget or how do, how do you do that? How do you manage the cost? Everything's a negotiation for me. Um, and it's, it's up to me first. I negotiate with the FOIA officers and then when it comes down to a cost, then I would have to approach our management and say, here's, here's what this looks like for me right now. But the same thing, I have that line in my template FOIA request, Jeff, that says it exceeds this amount. Please notify me 
Um, also knowing the Virginia state code is important about uh, when you would be required to pay in advance and when not, and also when a public body may require the requester to pay any amounts that are owed to the public body for previous requests, the records that may remain unpaid. That's an interesting one that I've run into a couple of times where say another person at my organization FOIA'd, but then they didn't get the payment. And once they got the information, they're saying this, we have to backtrack with that. Or for me, uh, there was one with Norfolk Public Schools a couple months back where I had FOIA'd three different things. Another tip I have is to kind of separate out what you're FOIAing if you can, because maybe they can provide one faster than the other. Uh, if you just lump everything into one email, they're gonna say, hey, we're gonna take all the time and all the ex extensions to try to do everything at this. But if you send three different emails, maybe you can get one faster and it's less cost or whatever that is. So another tip there, but I had sent two different FOIA requests to Norfolk Public Schools and based on the first one was more extensive. They were requiring a lot of payment in advance. I was negotiating back with them. I, I wasn't agree with how they were interpreting the state code. Uh, but then the second one, they said that they would not fulfill because I hadn't paid for the first one, which is actually not part of uh, Virginia state law either. And I got to just throw the code right back at them and say, that's not how this works, which is very <laughs> fun and satisfying. So definitely read that section if you haven't, enjoyable. But in terms for me and, and payment, negotiate, negotiate with them, ask for, for proof. I don't know the exact language, but I believe that if they're giving you a cost estimate and it's the head of the department, the executive director, I think it, there's language in there that says it's the lowest. Um, no, there's not, Megan. It, it could be anyone. They can say anyone can fulfill it. Yeah, it might've been from a previous state that I worked in, but um, that cut, you can negotiate and ask for proof of how much the time it will take and, and what the hourly rate is for that time and then go back and forth with them and that. And, that, and that's generally how it works. That makes sense. And, if, if you don't mind, if I could just chime in just for a second on that, because um, Jim mentioned earlier that you can FOIA a log of FOIA requests and you can see what has been fulfilled and how much was charged for previous times that, that this kind of request that you're looking for might, um, you know, my, the, the government agency has charged. Um, and uh, sometimes you can find that information also on Muckrock, one of the FOIA resources that we put in the, um, the chat box. Muckrock has a, they database the requests that people using Muckrock um, have submitted if the, if the requester allows it. If you're a journalist and you don't want anybody to know that you filed a, re a request, it doesn't go into the Muckrock database. But you have the option of putting it in there. And if you, you, you can then look in that database and see how much an agency charged for somebody else asking for a particular um, set of data. Plus if the data has been, or the records have been provided to somebody else, th that request has already been fulfilled. That you know that you can you can then piggyback on that and say i just really you know i see that you fulfilled this three months ago i just want the records that you gave to so and so you should be able to get that for free because it's already been paid for i, I would uh i'm going to jump in and i would say that uh you know copycat requests I, I i used to think that i was uh really smart but i'm not and, and, and generally speaking, things that I asked for, other people may have already asked for. And there's no reason at all, they've already done the redacting, they've already sent it out, there's no reason why they can't turn that around in a day. So FOIA, the FOIA log, see if you know other people, not, not all media organizations, uh, have asked for the same thing you're asking for, and then you can get that same records production in a day if it's electronic there, there's no they can't in, in good conscience charge you again so that's a good point well and i will say that in our in our city they actually um craig that uh, megan alluded to is very good about number one steering us toward um non-charge you know to people who can provide us information so we don't have to go through the foia process and there's no charge involved and definitely if we ask for something that's exactly what has been um, uh, uh, requested, then um, they provide that for free. So they definitely work with us on that. Megan, I think you've done some research on comparative costs. 
Um, well, just uh, actually uh, two weeks ago, I went through um, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press's Open Government Guide, which has um, all the state um, open records laws broken down into and sort of plugged into um, an outline and you can compare uh, various sections across topics. And um, so I was looking at that about um, how Virginia approaches fees um, because some states do have a media fee waiver and the federal government does have a media fee waiver that they can grant um, we don't have it in Virginia, and I've actually, I don't want it in Virginia because it allows the government to decide whose request is okay and whose is not, or whose is better and whose is not. Um, so, or what you're going to do with the records, which is usually something we don't like to see. But at any rate, um, I compared um, uh, various states, and what I found was that 13 states do not allow for any charges for the labor. Um, in providing the records, no search, no review, no nothing. They just allow just the co the cost of the copy. Wow. Or if you have a, you know, if they're all electronic, maybe the cost of a flash drive or something. Um, three um, don't allow labor generally, but have some very specific circumstances when they will allow it. Um, Twenty-two allow labor charges, but have some sort of cap. You know, it might be, um, as Evan was referring to, it might be you have to charge the lowest lowest rate, hourly rate of the person capable of doing it in the office. Or it might say the first X number of hours are free. In Colorado, there's a limit. You can't charge more than 38.50, I think it is, an hour. Um, so various limits like that. Uh, three statutes were unclear. There wasn't any case law that really helped explain the provisions there and the, and the outline was just kind of vague. And that left nine, including Virginia, and that don't place any limits whatsoever on labor. So they can charge you to search for it, to have the lawyer review it, to have another person redact it. And in the case of a reporter I was talking with um, two weeks ago, um, the cost of a second person to review and redact it. Um, so mm -hmm. that's where costs can really, really uh, ratchet up. And uh, we're looking, I'm working with some folks right now to see if we might be able to uh, get some reform going in Virginia about uh, how fees are imposed. That sounds great. I think every uh, media outlet in the state would join you in that effort. <laughs> so uh, we are almost um, at the end of uh, our time here today. I guess I would just like to um, just uh, open it up. Um, do the any of the panelists have anything that you would like to add, um, you know, based on the discussion that you've heard or the questions that have been raised? I, yeah. I, I, I just say one thing, you know, um, I left full time journalism about five or six years ago and um, and I started to work uh, for attorneys who represented, uh, again, employees, federal employees who were subject to some sort of discrimination. And, and, and part of part of building a case is, is getting interviews with other uh, colleagues and, and coworkers. And so my first assignment was to go out and interview high ranking federal employees of a, a certain federal employee who was wronged. And, and, and as a former, you know, current or whatever I am, journalist, I thought there's no way these people are gonna talk to me. Uh, but, but the fact is the, the one thing I wish I knew um, as a reporter that I do know now is that people are inherently polite and friendly. And if you show up at their door, whatever issue you're looking into, if you identify the uh, five or six or seven people near or around that agency or issue, and you show up at their door at 6.30 at night and you knock on their door and you're respectful and, and you tell them, listen, I didn't wanna bother you at work but I think this is an important issue 
and I'd really like to talk to you. Nine out of 10 times, they'll talk to you. And, and that's not something you can FOIA. Um, and, and, and I didn't, probably as a reporter, I didn't knock on enough doors. Um, and so for, for what that's worth, I, I think that um, a FOIA is a valuable tool. And, and I did not, as, as a reporter, I knocked on a lot of doors, but in retrospect, not enough. So that's, that's the only sort of thought that germinated into my head as, as, as we talk about all this. That's interesting. Another way of saying it, in, a, in another life, I actually worked for one of the U.S. intelligence agencies. And, you know, it's the difference between SIGINT and HUMINT. And, um, you know, I think one of the themes that has come out uh, today is the human element of, of this, that it's not just forms and, and um, you know, uh, suing or whatever, not that those aren't needed at times, but it, it sounds like the sort of overarching theme is build the relationships. Anybody else want to chime in or anything else from the audience before we wrap up? I'd, I'd kind of, I'd like to pick up on, on what you just said, Denise, in that um, even though we, you know, VCOG exists, you know, as the public's voice, you know, we still advocate on behalf of, of journalists as well. Um, but I, and I, I hope that folks um, who do work as, as working reporters remember that for all the problems that they may have in getting records, they are, they're in a better position than most citizens in that, you know, it is part of Evan's job to file regular FOIAs versus a citizen who is doing it on the weekends or um, after work. Um, media organizations might not have much money, but they probably have more money than an individual citizen to pay for FOIA requests. And also the big theme, like Jim and Evan are, are developing their relationships and their resources, citizens typically don't have that. They don't know where, they don't know how government's structured. They don't know who does what. They don't have a relationship that they can, can bank on um, to kind of help them through that. And in some, some places, especially small towns, I've been messaging with a woman out in far Southwest Virginia who they won't even send her notice of their meetings and they post um, Facebook messages that say, you know, she wants, she wants notice of a meeting and uh, she's just wasting taxpayer money by requiring us to put a stamp on an envelope. So there's a lot of retaliation that can go on when a citizen tries to exercise their rights under FOIA. So um, I'm not saying that to put a guilt trip on the media folks, but to say just how important it is that you are using FOIA and, and, and looking for uh, records and holding a government accountable because the public doesn't, it may be a law for everyone, but the public doesn't have the ability to use it in quite the same way that the press does. Thank you. Denise, one of the things that, um, this, this is a, a slight segue off of, of what Megan was just saying. Uh, this is a point that a, a couple of people have brought up is I think um, for the people who are journalists on here, getting information out in a creative way using FOIA creatively, thinking of, um, you know, I know Jeff, when you were at VCU, you did a lot of data journalism and getting numbers and doing comparative stuff uh, can be very valuable for getting information to folks or do the panda story, which is, is kind of fun. It's a government story, really. Um, and it's, uh, not, not to overstate this, but I, you know, a lot of people who are working in government, uh, really are folks, just folks. And if you treat them well, and you might punch their button the way Jim did with asking for the Panda records. Um, there's a lot of good stories out there, I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, and FOIA can be a way to uncover them. It's not confrontational. It's just helpful for all of us. Thank you. Well, before we sign off today, I'd like to recognize um, the person who actually made all of this possible. That's Stephanie Overman, 
who is the, um, uh, the technical coordinator of this webinar and is also the region two coordinator of SPJ. Um, Stephanie has extensive experience covering the business of managing people and she's the author of Next Generation Wellness at Work. So thank you very much, Stephanie. I don't know if she can, she's, she's muted. Well, thank you so much to our um, really terrific panel um, and to all of the people who have tuned in here today. Um, you know, we didn't even get to the uh, public information officer um, mm -hmm. facet of this. Maybe we need to do another another webinar and, and um, you know, sort of do the, the little recap of this one, like at the beginning, you know, like each episode of The Mandalorian, right? You got the little what happened on the last one, and then we can, we can go right into um, the, the related but different topic. So thank you all very much for being with us. And um, we'll try to, to put to use what, uh, what you all have said today. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thanks. We're done. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.